and move closer. Moving closer, moving closer, moving. There we go. All right. So we're in the book of Acts. And I'm excited to be in the book of Acts. Um, truth be told, I think I've taught this book maybe tied with the Gospel of John more than any other book. And it's a great book. There's so much to learn. And it's so applicable to us as Christians. We need to know this stuff because this is basically the equipping of the church. You see, where the gospel focuses on Jesus, and he's our model, and he, I mean, he's our everything, right? But the book of Acts, it's focusing now on the church at work. And realistically, while I will hand it to the disciples, having Jesus Christ in the flesh walking among them was probably an advantage now in the book of Acts, we are left with nothing less. In fact, we're left with more. Have you ever thought about that? That these guys had the power of the Holy Spirit in a powerful way, but we also have in addition to that, the completed work of the New Testament and the Bible. So all that said, we've got the gifts, we've got the word, now let's get in the word and figure out how to use it and apply it to our lives. Verse four, chapter one. And being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, commanded them to not depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. So he tells them not to leave. Now, this is one of those mind-blowing verses that I always like to think about, is that Jesus has died, been buried, resurrected, and here he is about to leave. It's moments, moments before he's going to ascend into heaven and they're not gonna see him in this way again. In many ways, this is the parting words of Jesus Christ. Now, if you are married or have children or loved ones who mean the world to you, and you were gonna depart and never see them again, what do you tell them? What would your parting words be? If you were gonna leave your children behind, what's the last bit of advice you give your kids? Like, hey, kid, like I'm not gonna see you again, but this is the thing. Don't forget this one thing. Now, the apostles had the gospel. The world around them was perishing people are on the highway to hell and they're the only ones with the remedy. They have the gospel, which is the power of Jesus Christ unto salvation, that's what it is. They have the message that can save the lost, transform the soul, and then Jesus says, but wait, tarry ye in Jerusalem, authorized King James. That's an interesting message because they're the ones, it's like a medic, right? You hear that there's a horrific accident out on the highway. There's 20 cars piled up. There are, there's smoke and there's fire. And you're there at the station and there's the ambulances and there's the fire trucks here in Grandview. They're right there at the same place. And you know the accident is out there. You know the people are hurting. You know the people are dying. And then the chief says, all right, we're gonna hang here for a bit. Why? <laughs> there's people in need. And Jesus says, you need to wait for the promise of the Father, which you have heard from me. Jesus tells the apostles that regardless of how significant it is that they need to get out there and preach the gospel, how, how they need to get out there and save the lost, they're told to wait because they need the promise of the Father. He says what you've heard from me. Now, we spent a good amount of time in the Holy of Holies of the New Testament. And you see, Jesus promised another helper. In John 14, he says, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I'll pray to the Father that he will give you another helper. The Paracletes, the, the Holy Spirit. He's called a helper or a comforter. He is the spirit of truth. And he says in verse 17 of John 14, for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
We see in verse uh, 26, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things I said to you. In 1526, it says, when the helper comes, he'll testify of me. All right, when he comes, he'll convict the world of sin. Verse 13 of chapter 16, he'll guide you in all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will glorify me. So Jesus keeps emphasizing the need of the Holy Spirit, not just inside, but now upon. Because in John chapter 20, verse 22, he said this to them, and then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So again, it's, it's not hard to walk through the Bible and see what the Bible teaches. And many churches, I don't know, I don't, it seems really plain to me. I'm just being honest. Uh, that, and I think the big key was in verse uh, 17 of chapter 14 of John. He dwells with you and will be in you. And then it said here, You need to wait for him to come upon you. And that's, I think, the difference. We have the three prepositions in the Greek. Some of you know these already. You should. Para, en, and epi. Para is with. The Holy Spirit is with you, he said in John chapter 14. En is in. He will be in you. And then finally, Jesus says, okay, he's always been with you. If you're a believer or an unbeliever, the Holy Spirit is with you. He's everywhere. But upon conversion, he comes to live in you. But now he says, before you take the message of salvation to the lost, before you leave the station to go help the people bleeding out on the highway, I'm telling you, as my parting words, my final words to the ones I love, you're gonna need him upon you, epi. And I think that's something that can be lost in many believers is that we lose the power of the Holy Spirit upon us. This is the power for service. This is the power to go above and beyond what we could do in and of our own strength. You see, the Holy Spirit in us, he begins to convict us of sin. He guides us and leads us. But all of that can be done in the flesh. You see, and it's not necessarily, quote unquote, a bad thing. We wish we were always in the Spirit, but we're not. But he'll guide you so that in the flesh you make the right decisions, not when you're in the flesh, but in my body of my own strength. I can, okay, the Holy Spirit's leading me. He's guiding me. He's kind of sending me down the right path. But it's in the moments where I need to be used by God. I don't just want my own strength guided through God's, you know, lane of truth. I want God's strength. I want God's power working through me in order to do that work which I could never do on my own. And so, They've got the fire truck loaded up. They got the ambulance ready to go. But Jesus says, wait. Wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. Now, a verse that maybe we'll have memorized here real soon is in chapter three, no, two, when Jesus is preaching. Where am I looking here? I'm gonna go down. And there we go. Verse 39. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So this promise that they waited for was a promise to them. It was a promise to their children and to all who are afar off. That's us. This same promise is promised to us today. That above and beyond salvation and God coming to live inside of me and convict and work inside of me, he's also promised to come upon me and give me power for service. So I would encourage all of us to take some time and reflect on that. And I wanna mention that we'll see in chapter four that they get filled again, that they have the power for a season, but perhaps the need goes away. 
perhaps they misuse it. There's a lot of reasons why the filling can diminish, go away. D.L. Moody said, I need fresh fillings because I am leaky. And so we'll see how we need fresh fillings of the Holy Spirit. And I wanna encourage you guys, are you full? Are you running full to the brim? The idea of that word epi, that baptism, is that you're overflowing with the Spirit. My favorite picture, I guess, is we once got a Pyrex dish out, we set it on the table uh, with the youth, and we put a cup in there, and we poured water in the Pyrex dish. The water was around the cup. Then I took a picture, and I filled the cup up. It went from para, around the cup, and in the cup, and then I demonstrated the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Took the jug and I dumped it. Little cup, big jug. What happens? It became so full of the Spirit that it poured out all around. That's the idea. God pouring out His Spirit to at a point where you begin to pour out into others and those around you. So we're gonna be doing this again and again and again, probably over the next couple of weeks as we study the book of Acts and the necessity of the Holy Spirit. Uh, our church website has for free, uh, you can go, there's like a free book section and you can download and read Baptism of the Holy Spirit by R.A. Torrey. It's like 60 pages, a uh, couple hours read for most people. Good book. And I would say, unless I'm forgetting something, I can put my seal of approval on that whole entire book. It's amazing. It's like, it's a good book. And so check it out so we can self-examine ourselves and learn about that Holy Spirit and how he wants to fill us and use us. Do I have a googly eye on my head? I'm sure that wasn't distracting for anyone. Yeah. Well, that's a good place to end on. So, why didn't someone tell me I had a googly eye on my forehead? All right, we're gonna close up today. I'm, I'm sure I'm getting close to the end here. So, hey, God bless you guys. Seek the Holy Spirit. Like in this live stream, after you click share and then comment and say, man, that was great. And then pray for some time. Lord, am I full of your Holy Spirit? Lord, is there room for more? Father, is it evident to those around me that your Holy Spirit is filling me and overflowing into their lives? Because if that's happening, people will see the love that you have for one another. God bless you guys. I will see you guys tomorrow.